hit a tree, the tree fell into the water, and then lightning struck it again. It created a little raft for me, and I jumped on that raft, and I floated right across, and it floated just perfectly. And they said, you know, that's completely, that's absolutely ridiculous. That's ridiculous, you know, you expect us to buy that garbage? You know, and he said, he said, well, you know, you, you say the same thing about the rest of the world. You know, you don't believe me, but you say the same thing about the rest of the world. You said that that's how, that's how you explain the rest of the world. So, you know, they didn't have a good answer for him. You know, he, they didn't have a good answer for him. So th they had to have a mechanism by which to explain how that took place. Right? So this is, the, this is uh, why Darwin's theory is extremely important. Because there must be some kind of mechanism, there must be some kind of explanation that's going to make sense to the human mind. Otherwise, people aren't going to accept it. So we continue. So Darwin's on this voyage. And after observing finch beaks and some other species in the Galapagos Islands, uh, Darwin formulates his theory of natural selection. Okay? And what basically what he's doing, he's saying, we take an analogy from microevolution within a species, and that should be applicable to macroevolution from one species to another. Now, microevolution is fairly well attested to. You can breed horses, for example. You can breed dogs, and you'll get different different species of dogs or different species of horses. So he's saying we can t use analogy and we can expand that and say that every single uh, species uh, evolved from another. Now, the importance of the theory. After understanding the history, what is so, what's so important about it, if you haven't understood yet? First of all, it's not just a scientific theory, meaning it's not like another scientific theory, for example, such as string theory, string theory in physics. It's not like Einstein's special theory of relativity, which is the speed of light is a constant. It is not like plate tectonics, which tries to describe the Earth. It is not, it is not, see, these theories, you, you don't see debates on them. You don't see, you don't see these theories going on in the media and people are fighting and getting all upset about it and you know, attacking one another and trying to you know, reform the curriculum to go and change it. Generally, you're not going to see that. Why? Because there's something more important about Darwin's theory than there are other scientific theories such as these. And to just give you a quote from Ashley Montague, for example, it's next to the Bible. Next to the Bible, no work has been quite as influential in virtually every aspect of human thought. Okay, not just the speed of light constant. But every aspect of human thought is the origin of the species. Okay. Now, technically, this quote is not correct uh, because uh, you know, coming because if if you look at it from a purely Western perspective, and you only consider that you know, we only look at it from this perspective, we don't care what the rest of the world thinks. Then technically, it's correct. But I mean, in reality, the Quran, for example, since I'm a Muslim, I can say that the Quran, even according to non-Muslim sources, is the most widely read book in existence. And it's the, it, it, according to non-Muslim scholars themselves, that it's the most influential book in existence. So and that wasn't mentioned here at all. But if we're just avoiding that part and just saying pure, from a purely Western perspective, that next to the Bible, you know, the origin of species is a very influential book, and that's that's a true statement. And Michael uh, Gisselin from the New York Times, he made a, also a quote, he said, natural selection allows biologists to dispense with such notions as purpose and design. Now that's extremely important because if biologists can't dispense with such notions as purpose and design, then they have to give some kind of purpose and design generally when they're teaching, otherwise questions are going to walk out intellectually unfulfilled. And then Professor Richard Dawkins from Oxford University says a very, very important quote, he says, Darwinism encompasses all of life. It provides the only, in his opinion, the only explana satisfying explanation for why we all exist, why we are the way that we are. So hopefully everyone understands that we're not just talking about a scientific theory now. We're talking about something much more than that, much more important than that. Now how is it supposed to work? Okay? The idea is that every living being descended from a common ancestor by means of small, cumulative, natural changes over a long period of time. And here's something what they call you know, the tree of life. This is a more modern one. There, there are older ones, as you'll see. But this is basically what the theory is saying, is that every single, every single living being had an ancestor, and uh, that one of those ancestors it, it evolved into the current living thing that we're seeing, and then it kept on evolving, and that's how we can explain all life on Earth. So what is needed for the theory to be legitimate? So first of all, what is a theory? You know, people that people have wars about, you know, why you call it a theory and say it's just a theory and they try and redefine terms and they try and discuss what the word theory means. We just try and understand what is a theory, what does theory generally mean? Okay, it's a logically self-consistent model or framework for describing the behavior of a related set of natural 
or social phenomena. Okay, it originates from or is supported by experimental evidence, which includes using the scientific method. Okay, so you have two models, okay, and each one of them is considered to be a theory, or you can say a model, you know, or a framework for describing some behavior. Okay. What is needed for the theory to be legitimate? Well, first of all, Charles Darwin, when you look at his own book, on chapter 6, he has an entire chapter. Actually, he has two chapters. But the first chapter, chapter 6, is called Difficulties of the Theory. So he's, he's, being, he's being honest in his book, and he's saying that, you know, there are some difficult difficulties in the theory. And what does he say? He says, in The Origin of Species, long before the reader has arrived at this part of my work, a crowd of difficulties will have occurred to him. Some of them are so serious that to this day I can hardly reflect on them without being in some degree staggered. Now this is really important because when you were studying the same theory in high school, the question is, you know, most of you, let, let's say some of you, okay, were just accepting it straight out, and maybe you didn't even realize that Darwin himself had some doubts because he was, he was not a dumb man, he was not a stupid man, you know, he was a pretty intelligent man, he knew what kind of what was going on. So the thing is, if you were paying attention in school properly, you know, you should have also at least had some major questions in your mind like Darwin did, and say, you know what, we need to get these unresolved questions answered. You know, otherwise, you know, most people, they probably weren't paying attention, they were busy doing, you know, whatever in high school, you know, I can attest to that, you know, people don't take education very seriously. But really, I hope that after tonight, people will begin to understand why education should be taken seriously, and why it's very important to study. So, Darwin had some of these objections. Uh, some of these, he realized that there's objections, and he said that these are difficulties of the theory. So what is needed? Okay, so now we discuss what is needed in order to prove the theory. The first thing that Darwin realizes, what we need, and all the scientists in his time, they realize we, we need is something called transitional forms, or the transitional forms between one species and another, or one kind, or one type of animal into another. So Darwin says again in his book, it says, why, if species have descended from other species by fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? But there should be tons of these things all over the place. Why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being, as we see them, well defined? So everything should be in confusion, and there should be tons of transitional uh, there should be tons of transitional forms all over the place. Why don't we see them? And then he continues, and he says, but just in proportion as this process of extermination has acted on an enormous scale, so must the number of intermediate varieties have acted on an enormous scale, which have formerly existed be truly enormous. So it must be truly enormous. There should be tons of these transitional forms all over the place. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely gradated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The explanation lies, I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. So Darwin answered this question. He says, why don't you see all these transitional forms? You should see them all over the place. And the answer is, we just have not look, we're not looking hard enough. You know, we just need to keep searching, and they're going to be there. Okay? So let's continue with this idea. What is needed? First of all, we need to understand what is a transitional form, and what is a fossil? Okay, what is a fossil, and how are they going to find these things? So a fossil is a remain of a living thing that's lived in the past. The skeletal structures of living beings whose bodies are rapidly insulated from air will survive intact. So you can analyze them after you find them. Remains give us information about the history of life on Earth. So it's very important to understand what is a fossil and what they're going to be doing and looking for these transitional forms. So the first transitional form. Question. Archaeopteryx. So in 1861, two years after the, the origin of species is published, they find uh, this lemon specimen, uh, code name BMNH37001, in Germany. Okay, and it's missing most of its head and neck, so it's an incomplete fossil. Okay, but that's fine. They make the claim that the Archaeopteryx was a half bird.